find yourself in the Beachview area of Pittsburgh, check out the official pizza of this show, Slice on Broadway, sharing an abnormal obsession with pizza we can relate to. Check them out at SliceOnBroadway.com and tell them this show sent you. I'm hungry, spark, but I ain't starving yet. Chain for the pain, cocktail, dog, set. Never said I was a gangster or a thug, but I'm an animal. Pizza for the taste of the pizza. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show, episode 118. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitters and uh, the video producer for uh, Sorgatron Media, IndieWrestling.us, uh, International Wrestling Cartel, Renegade Wrestling Alliance, Finding Zach Gowan, Montreal Theory, lots of stuff that I've had. Wow, I've touched a lot of stuff lately. Holy crap. Uh, with me also touching things with this voice piece, especially Inspire, hey Pro, especially Pro, Inspire Pro Wrestling. If it's getting awkward, it's going to get a little bit sexier here later in the show, and you'll find out why. Eamon Payton is with us. Eamon, too, please, on the Twitter. Happy to be here, so happy to always be talking about indie wrestling, as I love to do, <laughs> doing whatever you just said I do with my voice box. Just, a, just accept it and let it go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> InspireProWrestling.com. We can hear his voice on the wrestling side. And also with us, he's sticking around from our uh, uh, a fantastic, epic episode of Wrestling Mayhem Show. Uh, he's BC Steel. And he was on here a couple weeks ago. We were talking in Meadville, of course, and he's hanging out in the studio. Can't get rid of me. One SF podcast on the Twitter. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> and uh, we'll be talking. Some indie wrestling with you after this interview, right? Sounds good. Yeah. I, I have a little experience. A little bit of experience. <laughs> and, uh, of course, this is your Indie Mayhem Show. Check out this and everything else at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, YouTube for the Wrestling Mayhem Show, the Facebook for Wrestling Mayhem Show. All this stuff goes on all that. Um, and you can check us out live.wrestlingmayhemshow.com. Uh, we like to say this starts at about 10 p.m. Eastern time, but let's be honest, you could be here all night. Um and uh, uh, and of course, check us out. Uh, 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 drop us a line four one two two zero six WMS zero or uh, Good Times at Wrestling Mayhem Show dot com. If you have any uh, indie wrestling news thoughts, uh, anybody we should be talking to, uh, questions for anybody we've announced for interviews coming up, uh, let us know right there. And uh, uh, with that, uh, so we got a great new fall season. What the hell is that title? Uh, we got a great lineup uh, today. Uh, Star studded interview. Uh, first of all, with Les Thatcher, um, but also later in the show, we're going to have a video that we posted up on the site and audio for you guys on that format uh, with Bruno San Martino and a little bit with uh, Dan Marino. I know, not a wrestling guy uh, necessarily, necessarily, but he was fantastic in Ace Ventura. Um, so from a, a, a signing, or not a signing, a, a signed dedication ceremony here in Pittsburgh uh, earlier today as of this recording um, in South Oakland, uh, where they grew up. So it was great to hear a little bit uh, from Bruno about that and a little bit of the dedication ceremony. Uh, but first, like I said, Les Thatcher is the main interview today. Had a great uh, long conversation with him. He's uh, uh, doing training and is done, geez, everything in wrestling. Uh, let's just get the interview. Take a look. On the line with me right now is uh, one of the minds, the masterminds, I guess you could say, behind the Elite Pro Wrestling Training out there, EPWT.com. If you want to check that out, Les Thatcher on the line right now. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Mike. How about yourself? Oh, very good. Now, we had a very spirited talk before this. I'm glad that the, that the, the vibe is, is, is carrying through the interview, and uh, it's good to have you with me here today. Um, well, but I always enjoy discussing uh, the business I've spent uh, the majority of my life in, I guess. <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, first of all, we usually like to uh, get to know our, our interviewees here. And uh, I, and we like to, because we like to, if you're in the business, especially as long as you've been in this business, you have to be a fan of the business. And we like to find out, like, what is, what's the thing that got you into, into wrestling? What is your kind of earliest memory of pro wrestling? Oh. Oh, Lord, long before you were born, probably, oh, sure. probably long before your mom and dad might have been around. <laughs> uh, I, I became a fan uh, watching a neighbor's uh, black and white uh, 10 inch screen uh, one Friday night. Um, I was nine years old. We, we actually didn't have a TV in our at our home and, until after this. But I, I saw my first professional wrestling. And, uh, and for whatever reason, it, it fascinated me. It hooked me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started to get into it. My mom and dad uh, became fans. This was, this was back, <clears throat> excuse me, in the late 40s, uh, 49, 50, somewhere in there. 
Uh, God, don't ask me to remember. That's too many years back to, to give you the exact tie-in. But, um, you know, wrestling was so big on television at the time, mainly, well, wrestling, boxing, and roller derby because they were in confined areas. And back then, TV cameras were so ponderous. You know, they probably weighed uh, 200 250 pounds a piece and they were on rolling tripods but it wasn't you know the mobile handheld jobs that they have today so uh wrestling boxing and and roller derby were just ideal uh for television at, at that point in time so we uh we got a live show from here on friday nights at, at uh, cincinnati's music hall uh we got television from uh, wwd in dayton ohio on saturday and through the week we we picked up uh marigold gardens in chicago uh, uh st nicholas arena in new york uh, Hollywood Legion Stadium in L.A., and we got Texas-style wrestling on, uh, they called it Kinescope, don't it, you know, it was the fore, uh, forerunner of film or videotape and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, they talk now about, you know, there's so much wrestling, uh, you know, on the air, but back then uh, there, there was a lot of it too. We, but And there was only three television channels that we had available to us, and uh, if you turn one of those channels on at, say, 1 a.m., if you were, uh, couldn't go to sleep, all you get was a test pattern. It was, <laughs> TV was off usually by uh, probably by 11 o'clock in the evening. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so you had a pretty vibrant because I know, uh, you know, I, I've been looking lately at a lot of what Pittsburgh studio wrestling was and what that what what was ha- coming up through here. So Cincinnati, like you, you were you were close to a lot of hotbeds uh, kind of in those days. Yeah, uh, I'll have promotions out of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, which is basically a suburb uh, of Columbus, uh, was one of the biggest promotions of the time. Uh, half ran Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, uh, Indiana, and uh, Kentucky. And uh, and again, I didn't, I never worked for the Al Half promotion, but in talking to, you know, as once I broke into business, talking to guys that I'd seen wrestle or, or had worked for the Half operation, they were running two to three towns every night. And uh, he, he had on his roster, I guess, 70, 75 wrestlers at all times. So, and, and of course, we're talking about, you know, all the different televisions uh, that I was able to see. Uh, it also, uh, half at one point or another brought uh, virtually every one of those wrestlers uh, from Chicago, New York, LA, Texas, wherever uh, came through this area. And so eventually they ended up in Cincinnati on a Friday night. Awesome. So how did you go from, you know, much like where a lot of us are kind of watching on TV and especially these days absorbing maybe too much wrestling? I don't know, can there ever really be too much at this point? Uh, but if you're a big enough fan, but what made you move from uh, being a spectator to actually getting involved with it? Well, you know, I, I was I was a job. I, I, I got involved in uh, organized athletics at the age of seven, uh, playing Sandlot baseball. But I played baseball, football, basketball, wrestled at the YMCA, and um, honestly got into uh, drag racing uh, at age fifteen. Before I had a, actually had a driver's license to drive on the street, I was driving on the racetrack, and so it, it basically came down to. Um, you know, drag racing as a future for me or uh, professional wrestling. Why? I, I I couldn't honestly give you an answer to that. It's just those are the two things, I guess, that fascinated me the most. And so, um, of course, you know, back then wrestling was a closed shop. And, uh, I mean, you just didn't, not like today, there wasn't a school on every street corner or a pseudo school, I should say, on every street corner. And, um uh, you know, everybody was smart to the business. That wasn't the case, uh, but it, it was tough to get involved. So uh, at age 18, I made the, the journey to Reynoldsburg, Ohio, which is roughly 100 miles from my home. Uh, I lived in the suburbs of Cincinnati and uh, went up there to see if I could, you know, get involved. And, and the, the guy who was a, the booker at the time also was a wrestler. Of course, I didn't even know what a booker was. Uh, a guy named Frankie Talibur was nice enough to talk to me and, and told me, first of all, you know, he probably needed some more experience and I need to put on some size. I probably weighed 175, 76 pounds at the time. I was 18 years old. And uh, so it was just like, 
you know, sort of a, a dead end. I didn't know what to do. I, it was, I knew it was what I wanted to at least try, but I, you know, how is this going to happen? I mean, I, again, it just, you know, and, and looking back, I realized too that uh, them not allowing me to break in there was probably probably saved a lot of wear and tear on my body because they had some of the greatest shooters in the business at the time, all working for Al Hef, and, and I actually met some guys that worked with some guys later on that had broken in there, and it, it wasn't an easy haul. But anyway, in, uh, I was an avid reader of Wrestling Review magazine, which was the big newsstand publication of the Times. And uh, the forerunner, I guess, of every wrestling school was Tony Santos, uh, his small promotion based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, in one of the issues of uh, Wrestling Review, uh, there was a story on Tony Santos's promotion in Boston, and it showed a picture of a ring in, in a in a gym, and how Santos uh, would uh, was helping young athletes that wanted to break into professional wrestling at the absorbent cost. I'll have you know, three hundred dollars for six months, <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, I sent Santos a letter, uh, again, for those too young to know, there was no such thing as uh, emails or tweets or texts or anything like that. And they sent me in return a um, a trifold, you know, with pictures and the information and so forth and so on. So uh, this was the only approach that was open to me. So in uh, February of 1960, uh, so I started to say 70, 1960, um, got on a Greyhound bus uh, here in Cincinnati and made the journey to Boston and uh, started my training there. And, I, and uh, February, of, mid-February of 1960, had my first match. Uh, Santos put me in my first match July the 4th, 1960. So uh, this July the 4th will be my 56th anniversary in this goofy business. Wow. Wow. And, and, and you've, again, you've, uh, uh, I think as most great uh, personalities in the business have, um, have really kind of become a chameleon. You, you, you've been behind the mic. You've, uh, I, I saw you were actually part of the first edition of uh, Worldwide Wrestling Federation's magazine, which I believe uh, uh, eventually becomes what we know of recent years as WWE magazine, right? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that came about. Uh, that was the first time that Vince and I ever worked together in any capacity. Uh, I actually, George Napolitano, uh, who still does uh, wrestling photography, uh, lives in Brooklyn. Uh, I had done a similar magazine, same, basically using the same printer, same artist, and, and same format. I had originated the format with uh, Jim Crockett Promotions in Charlotte, and we actually uh, did the first all-color magazine, the first with a theme center, or first with any kind of centerfold, but with a theme centerfold. Uh, and we used an artist rendering for our covers. We just didn't use photographs. So uh, Vince had seen this. He and George got to talk, and they contacted me. So, uh, yeah, I did the first WWWF, if you happen to have a copy of that. And you look inside, you'll see that it's published by LT and Associates, which LT would be myself, and Associates would be whoever the hell happened to work on it at the time. But George did the sh uh, – they came up with, the, you know, the, the rough idea of what they wanted to do in terms of content, who they wanted on the cover – and George uh, would send me photographs, and the young lady that I was dating at the time, she and her sister and I would spread all this uh, and the rough stories out on my apartment floor and put the layout together. And then I used the artist and, and the, uh, uh, the shop in, in Charlotte that I'd use for the Crockett magazine to, to do the WWWF magazine. So, yeah, I was, I was the originator and the, and the first guy to deal with uh, Vince and magazines. Awesome. And of course, as I mentioned uh, briefly, uh, you had a, a period of commentating with, you know, names that everybody knows, like Jim Ross, Gordon Soley. We actually talked with the daughter of Gordon Soley around a, a book that was being released several years ago on the Wrestling Mayhem show, a pre precursor to this. Um, did that seem like just a natural fit that just uh, your abilities on the mic just kind of transfer over and your knowledge at that point? You know, it, it, the funny thing is several things that I've done in a business have just, I, I've fallen into it in, 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 a, in a way. Uh, you know, I, I, I was always, Mike, I was always a frustrated disc jockey. This would be back <laughs> from the, the Wolfman Jack uh, 
era, you know, I always thought I wanted to be a, a rock and roll DJ. And uh, I, I did some uh, announcing. I, uh, I mentioned drag racing and one of the car club that I belong to here in Cincinnati. We were part of a timing association that built the first drag strip in this area. And I did some of the tower announcing there. But how I got involved with uh, the actual uh, wrestling announcing was um, – a guy that had been my next door neighbor in Charlotte, Rudy Kay, started promoting the maritime provinces in eastern Canada. And uh, he invited me up for the second season to wrestle there. And uh, which, you know, I, I went up and started wrestling for Rudy. And, and so as it came, came about, um, his announcer was originally from Toronto and uh, had a death in the family. And so uh, we used to we used to, we lived in Moncton, New Brunswick. We went to uh, Halifax on Tuesday. Wrestled Halifax on Tuesday. Did our TV in Halifax to, uh, Wednesday morning, and then went to St. John's, New Brunswick, uh, for the uh, Wednesday evening show. But anyway, uh, so Rudy calls me one Monday before the show in Moncton, and just starts shooting the breeze with me. And finally he says, you know, you were talking about, you know, how we, when we were on the road, you were talking about this and that and the other thing. And, and you said, you might like to try commentary, you know, once you're done wrestling. And I said, yeah, he said, well, be sure to bring your uh, suit and tie with you to Halifax. And I said, why? And he said, well, because you're, you're going to be our announcer tomorrow uh, or Wednesday in, in, in Halifax. And the K's, uh, Rudy and his brothers, were all noted for their ribbing. So at first I thought, yeah, right, sure, this, this is just a rib. But he convinced me that it was not. So um, going in cold, you know, I mean, I, I'd been interviewed on, on shows here and there. This was in 1970. And, um, but I, you know, back then there were no teams of announcers. It was just a announcer for the most part. And sometimes a wrestler would come out and, and sit in. But uh, I had never done anything like this. So I walked in Wednesday morning. I'd never read a format or a run sheet or, or never queued in or out of a segment in my life. And, and that was my first experience. And uh, I got through it. Um, how? I'm not real sure, but I did. And uh, did it well enough that, uh, that you know, the, uh, at the end of the week, he pulled me aside and he said, look, he said, we like the way you, you did the show. And instead of, uh, I'm not sure when this guy, the guy from Toronto was able to come back or, you know, he's got some complications with the, the will, the family will or something. I'm not even sure what it was, to be honest. And uh, so uh, if I'll give you extra, you continue to wrestle here, but I will pay you extra and you finish out. The, the season ran from April to mid-October there, and then they shut down for the rest of the year. And he said, then, you know, you, uh, you will finish up and, and uh, finish out the season for us. And I said, OK. And that's how I got my foot in the door in terms of announcing. I basically fell into it, came back to this. Now, he offered uh, to, you know, wanted me to stay or come back the next season and actually not wrestle, but help him in the office and pr produce the TV and host it. And, of course, at that point, I'd just been wrestling uh, 10 years and still knew I had plenty of gas in the tank and, and was still interested in, you know, in staying in the ring. Uh, so I, I said, no, you know, uh, appreciate the offer. And, uh, but I just, you know, I think I'll continue to go ahead and wrestle and, and see what's up. So, uh, I came back to the States and ended up, uh, in Tennessee for a, a brief period, went down to Florida and from Florida, uh, the Crockett's were, I had been to the, uh, the Crockett territory uh, twice before this, but they were looking for a number two babyface team um, in the territory. And it were calling around and called Tampa and ended up uh, the Tampa office re uh, recommended uh, Danny Miller and myself. So we went in actually just to work. And one day I was in the office in Charlotte and uh, Lord Littlebrook, the midget wrestler was there. And so he was in talking to Mr. Crockett. This had been Jim Crockett Sr. I was talking to Mr. Crockett, and I came in, and, and we were chatting. And Brooks says to Mr. Crockett, he said, uh, why don't you have less on your television? And Jim looked at him. He said, well, I do. he does wrestle on our team. Oh, no, no, Mr. Crockett. I mean, why isn't he one of your announcers? And Jim said, what are you talking about? So Brooks said, well, you know, he did Rudy's TV last summer. 
and did a real good job. And Mr. Crockett said, looked at me, he said, you, why didn't you tell me? I said, well, you, nobody asked, you know, I never considered it. So that opened the door for me to start doing some uh, bits, you know, sitting in with the other announcers there. And finally, you know, uh, I was uh, ended up with a spot in the office and, and helped produce the shows and uh, hosted the B show for a, a long time and then got involved with helping uh, produce all the promos and that sort of thing. And from there, it, uh, you know, I, Atlanta was uh, in the midst of a war in 80, or 73 and 74. Uh, Jack Briscoe and Tim Woods had bought in down there. Gordon was flying in from uh, Tampa every week. And uh, so they made me an offer. Jimmy Crockett didn't want me to just by this time it was Jim Jr. Jim Crockett Jr. didn't want me to leave. So uh, I don't know if I started boring you here with this, this crazy <laughs> no, story. Stop me. Um, no, no. So anyway, in, in the meantime, actually, I've been uh, 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 bringing up a little bit uh, of your days uh, behind the mic. And I got to say, I got to I got to respectfully say you had a rocking head of hair back then. Uh, I'm presuming this is in the <laughs> 70s. We're showing that for our friends yeah, on the video. I wish I had it again now, Mike. Can you find <laughs> that for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, uh, and, and I can definitely see the the the, the DJ vibe you you uh, you you just you know was 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 just in you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, listen, I, uh, I I love listening to the DJs of the fifties and sixties because you know now you, they basically just do commercials. They, but back then, you know, they were part of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the DJs were, but uh, so anyway, you know, uh, Atlanta wanted me to. They wanted me to come down there, and Jimmy didn't want me to go. So I got a call from Eddie Graham, and uh, who was the promoter, for those who don't know, was part owner and uh, one of the great bookers of all time, but, but was one of the owner of the Tampa Territory. And, uh, of course, they were fighting, the NWA was fighting the war uh, with the Gunkel promotion in Atlanta. And uh, so Eddie said, well, you know, Jim doesn't want you to leave, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to give your notice there as, as a wrestler. And you're going to tell them you're coming to Tampa to wrestle for me. And on your way to Tampa to wrestle for me, you're going to drop all your belongings off in Atlanta and stay <laughs> down here and wrestle for me a month. And then I'm going to send you to Atlanta to do the television there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to get in the midst of, you know, because I, I had a good reputation with the territories where I worked and I didn't want to create the Crockett's have been very good to me. And I didn't want to create a problem there either. So as it came about, that wasn't necessary. Jim, uh, Jack Briscoe. Uh, kept pestering Jimmy Crockett uh, about that. And finally, Jimmy said, well, Les wants to go, he can go. So I went to Atlanta, and, and obviously Gordon and I had become friends in Tampa in, in 1967 uh, when they uh, made me NWA Rookie of the Year. Uh, Gordon was the actual guy that presented. Uh, that my, was my first run in Tampa. And Gordon was the guy who presented me with the award and, and so forth. And then plus he and I were both big into race cars. So we had that in common as well. So we became fast friends. So anyway, I got the opportunity to work with Gordon there. And uh, then in, in back in 74, I went back to uh, Charlotte. And uh, then my friend Ron Fuller bought the Knoxville Territory in uh, late summer of 74 called me and said, I need, uh, I know nothing about television. I've bought this territory. I want to redo the entire television. And, uh, I would like you to come in. I'll give you carte blanche, uh, to do whatever, you know, within reason, anything you want to do in terms of putting the television show together. And I love to be creative and, uh, the challenge was there and I, you know, en enjoyed that. So, uh, from, November of 74 to November of 77, I would pass myself in the air occasionally going to and from. I start <laughs> the first of the week in Charlotte and we put together our TV on Monday. I wrestle Monday night uh, and Tuesday uh, we go to uh, be in Raleigh to do the, all the promos and the, uh, the TV shows on Wednesday and uh, possibly wrestle Thursday, Friday morning. I got on a plane, flew to Knoxville Ron would pick me up. We would go write the uh, television for Knoxville Saturday for Saturday morning, wrestle Friday night, 
do the TV, produce and host the TV Saturday morning, wrestle Saturday night. He put me back on the plane Sunday. And that's the way I lived from uh, November 74 to November 77. Jeez. So, like I say, I pass myself in the air sometimes. Oh, there I go. Here I come. I'm not sure at this point in time. And uh, so then finally, Ron wanted me to move up to Knoxville and help run the, uh, the operation, which I did. And then he was, you know, it was sold to Barnett. And uh, I worked with Jim. I, well, that's where the name Thatcher came from. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jim uh, Jim Barnett gave me the name Thatcher. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, you know, that's kind of how the whole thing started. And, and then I continued to burn all these uh, that I can not only at both ends, but in the middle and a couple other places, too, until 1980, when I thought, OK, enough's enough. Um, you know, physically, I felt that I'd pretty much done in terms of in-ring wrestling, most any, everything and anything that, you know, I was capable of. And uh, I realized I could handle, you know, do the uh, television production and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, so uh, in 80, 1980, I decided to hang the trunks up and uh, stuck strictly to the TV until I got involved with training, which came up in the early 90s. Wow. Well, let's get into a little bit about the training. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, you, you've been attached to some some pretty decent names here over the years, include, uh, being a part of their training, including, of course, Dean Ambrose, who's uh, uh, making a name for himself these days on WWE television. Um, uh, other guys like uh, Eli Skipper, uh, I, my list has escaped me here, uh, Johnny the Bull, uh, Shannon Moore, Shark Boy, BJ Whitmer, Matt Stryker. Uh, you, you've been doing this for a while. Uh, what What is a kind of the philosophy, the philosophy for training for you? Uh, well, you know, to to me, Mike, uh, you know, I, I realize there's the ever change. You know, there's more comedy in this business, and I won't say good comedy because most <laughs> of it isn't, uh, and and more acrobatics. But the fundamentals and the foundation of this business, I don't care if it's 1950, 1970, or 2016, the fundamentals and the foundation are still the same. Right. And so to me, it's uh, putting the proper foundation and fundamentals in, into an athlete uh, before, before all the other stuff, you know. Um, Carl Anderson started with me. <clears throat> I know somebody was mentioning on his there uh, when he and uh, Luke made their first appearance two weeks ago that he was more a technical wrestler. And I said, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but it's true that, uh, you know, uh, it, that's that's the foundation for this business. And, and let me make it. I love metaphors and comparisons and, and I'll drive you nuts with that. But uh, a movie, a, dr a dramatic movie that won an Academy Award in 1950 and a movie the movie that won the best drama this year in 2016 you're going to find the obviously the ones probably black and white ones in color the verbiage will be different the costuming will be different the technology will be different but the fundamentals of why both of those movies were good enough to win that award will virtually be exactly the same because to write a good drama how you put that drama together again, where, you know, the setting, the, the era, the costuming and so forth and so on will change. But the foundation, the fundamentals of building that drama aren't going to change at all. And in our business, regardless of what everybody else thinks or says, I, I still firmly believe that that is the case. Certainly. I know in discussion as us as fans uh, watching from week to week, the uh, myriad of programs on TV these days, um, there's a lot of a lot of question comes up. Well, 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 this isn't really new. It's like, well, no, because the good stuff is what works. Right. So you are going to see little elements of that over and over again. Right. Well, you know what? And here's the crazy thing. You know, I use uh, a lot of uh, old videos mm -hmm. to teach with. Uh, Buddy Rogers and Pat O'Connor, Comiskey Park, 1961, when, when Rogers took the title, the NWA world title from, from O'Connor. And I can name you several others. Uh, the Probably one of the, a couple of the most recent would be uh, Benoit Regal at, at Pillman 2000. Uh, uh, Flair, if you go to YouTube, Flair and Brad Armstrong from 1995. 
but what these what all what's the same about all those particular things is they all tell a story. They all build uh, to a climax. Uh, again, with a lot of young, you know, uh, I make a joke out of it, I, but I, you know, I say that with a lot of young people, I use sexual references because a lot of young men might get bored with technicalities, but the minute you throw the word sex out there, you got their attention. What are you just saying? <laughs> What's he talking about, sex? Uh, but, uh, you know, a good wrestling match and good sex are similar in as much as they both start with foreplay and sh- or should and should build to a climax. It's that simple and that hard all at the same time. Certainly, certainly. There needs to be needs to be that story told in, in the long run there. Well, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how, you know, you're kind of traveling into the business and, and finding a school and how it's so prevalent. You know, I can think of uh, two, maybe three schools as it is in this area uh, here in the Pittsburgh area. We also have about, I don't know, six promotions last I checked. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you think that there's too many of these schools? Is it too easy to become a pro wrestler at this point? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Uh, now, listen, when I say that, uh, I, I don't mean uh, when I, you know, 56 years ago, when I went to Boston, uh, it was a closed shop. And, and to be very frank and honest, they handed me my ass for a week right. or more uh, to see if I was going to stick. And, and as I mentioned, I started my training in mid-February of 1960. My first match was July the 4th of 1960. You know, when they smartened me up to the, actually sat me down and smart me up to the business, the morning of July the 4th, 1960. <laughs> yes. Wow. So I wasn't actually told. I mean, I started to kind of figure things out, but you realize too, that with the veterans back then, if you'd open your mouth, somebody would have stressed you and proved you, you were full of crap, right? Mm-hmm. So you think this is not real? Check this out, you know, uh, because there were a lot of, t- you know, Jimmy, my friend Jimmy Cornette has, has a great analogies. You know, back in the day, there were a lot of tough guys that never hurt each other. Today, there's a lot of guys that aren't tough and they beat the shit out of each other, right? <laughs> well, and, that's, and that's the interesting thing, too, because if you look at today and the way, uh, you know, a lot of the wrestling happens, like you can kind of tell that it's fake. You, you, you couldn't go that long without figuring out right back then the wrestling was wrestling right the wrestling was not that far off from uh, no, amateur no. wrestling right so they, there was a lot right. easier to to relate um um you know uh, between the two well you know here 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 again a, a comparison or analogy um I, I tell young guys today when i when i do these training camps and, and seminars uh you know back 50 years ago We've got to gotten away with a lot of the goofiness that I see today, and I emphasize goofiness uh, that I see today because there was nothing to compare us with back then, right? Today, there's a thing called UFC, and if you watch enough UFC and then you watch some of the cartoonish stuff that, that goes on in the professional wrestling business, you know it's a bunch of crap. I mean, it can't possibly be anything else. And when I say that, please understand, I love the business. I respect the business. I want the business to flourish. Uh, but I honestly, truly believe, and this is not not the, uh, the, the, the musings of an old man who's bitter because he can't do a quadruple somersault, <laughs> that our business has got to turn, turn it down just a little and get back to the fact that the other thing that always drew a lot of money over the years was getting the fans emotionally involved. And I don't mean chanting your, your, your catchphrase or uh, whatever. I mean legitimately getting the fans emotionally involved. Mm-hmm. And that's, I don't believe that's the case. I mean, you know, uh, if you're really into it as a business and paying attention to it as a business, the fans aren't that emotional. I mean, it's seldom that they get emotionally involved any longer. And I think there, there's the, the big uh, difference, and and uh, it, it's 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 not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think about like the current talent coming up? Are there are there any uh, uh, guys out there that you, or girls uh, that you think really are uh, uh, delivering those fundamentals and, and telling a good story these days? 
I, I think there's a lot of guys that have the good fundamentals. And, and you know, when I say now I, I don't like this particular character or that, but it's not a personal issue. You know, it's not because I don't. Some of these guys I, that I don't care for their gimmicks or, or what they're doing uh, is I don't even know the guy. Or the, you know, all I know is, you know, it's like watching a particular movie or uh, soap opera or something and say, well, I don't like that character. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a it's not an affront to the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to the actor. It's it's about the character, you know. So and I realize the one thing, again, that I tell I tell every young man that I work with first, last and always, this is a business. And if they pay you to be a jackass. And the price is right. Be a jackass. Don't hesitate a moment, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, but uh, still get the sound basics under you and and understand the inner workings of this business. You know, you know, sadly enough, Mike, there's and and I'm not the only one. I've had a couple younger people who are. And, you know, you mentioned schools and stuff. There are a handful of legitimate people that can get you ready to go to the big dance in this country, and there are hundreds who absolutely cannot and yet will sell themselves as trainers. It's, again, I don't mean that they're bad people. It's just you can't teach. You can't. I can't teach you to climb Mount Everest. I can watch every movie I've ever seen about Mount Everest. I can read all the books on how to climb Mount Everest. But if I haven't climbed it, I can't get you to the top of it either. Right. And uh, you can only teach what you yourself know, you know. And like I say, so there's just a handful of people that can prepare you for that. But the bottom line is to understand, again, the, the basic fundamentals. It's not about entertaining yourself. It's not. a. And here again, here comes one of my sexual references. I sometimes watch <clears throat> matches, especially on the independent level. And it, it, it's almost a form of public masturbation. I mean, these guys are entertaining themselves. They don't even, you know, forget that there's a people out there that bought a $10 or $15 or whatever dollar ticket. Uh, I think this is a cool move. I'm going to do it 10 times. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that's not your job, you know. This is about the, the proper mindset going out there is to bring, draw these people in emotionally, you know, stand them up when you want them up and sit them down when you want them down. And uh, again, uh, the young people today, because of the nature uh, of most people are relatively smart that our business is pre predetermined, that it is in a great part a show. Uh, but still, the idea is to suspend their disbelief. You and I both became aware that movies weren't real, probably at a very young age. And uh, but still a good bad guy in a movie or a good script will draw you in. I don't know if you ever were a fan or ever watched uh, Dallas, the, the, the original or uh, the reincarnation a couple years ago. But uh, my point is uh, the guy that played uh, J.R. Ewing, right? Larry Hageman, who's passed away now, was the most amazing heel of all time. I mean, I'm smart. <laughs> you know, I know it was a work, uh, but, uh, you know, it was like, Somebody needs to kick his ass, right? I can't wait till next week to see if they get to him. And that's what's missing in our business today is that it's not about waiting till next, you know, to see what happens next week. And and again, because people are relatively smart to our business, your strongest weapon, if you are a performer, is the element of surprise. And I'm sad to say that for the most part, uh, the sh- the shows I watch today. Uh, I'm, there's no surprises there. You you kind of know uh, the finish before you see the. You know, uh, if you, if you don't know the finish, you realize that okay, this is going nowhere. Um, a bad example or a good example, I'm not sure what you'd call it. Uh, one of the things that I call the distraction finish. You see it on WWE all the time. That is where. Uh, the one guy who steps out on the ramp and he's a hundred yards from the ring yet. He so, uh, makes the, uh, the, whoever in the ring he's, he's going against next. So nervous that the guy can't stand what he's, he forgets about the guy in the ring, turns his back and he's rolled up and beaten. I probably in 20 years of in ring experience 
may have used, and normally it's the baby face that embarrasses the heel and the heel gets, gets beaten when he shouldn't because it, in the, the, the proper order of things, the baby face is not the guy, he gets his ass handed to it, but he's not the guy that gets embarrassed. It's usually the heel that gets embarrassed. But anyway, my point is that probably in 20 years of working in ring on an average of five nights a week, um, I may have used that finish six times, six times in 20 years. I've seen it more than six times in the last five months in on one show. Right. So the element of surprise is not there. We're talking about the old matches. Uh, there's a lot of things that are old, were old, are now new because nobody's using it. <clears throat> because the young people today haven't seen them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and if you were to go back and use them, you know, that's one of the things. The funny, I mentioned Rogers O'Connor. Uh, every time I sit down and watch that with a bunch of young kids, somebody, goes, oh, my God, yeah, that's a cool move. Use it. It's new. It's brand new to you because the people that you're performing to today have never seen it. Am I making sense? I hope. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Well, tell me a little bit what you guys are doing over that elite pro wrestling training. Um, I know, uh, you know, you got, you got your stuff going on there. You got seminars coming up. Uh, what do you have hoping on, uh, going on here? Well, you know, I, I actually don't have a school here in Cincinnati. Any, I, I, I sold uh, my operation here in 2002 mm-hmm. when Harley race and Ricky steamboat and I, uh, formed elite pro wrestling training. We started doing what we called super camps, uh, three day weekend camps, the three of us. And then Harley's health, uh, took a nosedive. Ricky got the offer to go, uh, with WWE. I had been with WWE already. So anyway, I've, I've but uh, so I do one day or weekend training camps, uh, for independent promotions around the country. And, um, they consist of virtually, you know, uh, a normal weekend is uh, I'll go in on a Friday. We'll do a Q and a session, uh, on Friday evening and then, uh, train, start training on Saturday morning, 9 AM break for lunch an hour. Uh, if there's a show that night, obviously, depending on the time of the show and, and the proximity, uh, we may quit training by three or four. Uh, if there's no show, we'll go to five, uh, Sunday, the same deal. And then I'll usually leave and and come home on Monday. Um, But we cover in-ring psychology, conditioning, uh, tag teams, single matches, uh, pacing, telling a story. Uh, We go, you know, one of the things that I find, especially on the indies, uh, you can't learn this business. I think one of the reasons there's so many great workers that came from our era, the sixties and the seventies is because we worked every night. You know, this I make a joke of it, but I, I, I said, you know, you can call me at 3 a.m. and call up, call a spot over the phone. I'll jump up and run it. You know, it just <laughs> becomes it becomes second nature. And that's what this business has to be. You have to re, do it repetitively over and over and over to get to where it becomes second nature. And so the indie guy, if you're first of all. I don't care who's the trainer, where the school is. If you're not training and if you're not in ring at least three times a week, you're pretty much wasting your time. If you're wrestling once a week or once a month, you are wasting your time because you can't develop your timing. Uh, you're, you're, you're in ring, Never mind your gimmicks and your music and your hand signals and all that craziness. That's the last thing I'm concerned with. And the biggest thing I find is cardio. And realize you're you're in a in a serious if you're out there seriously trying to perform and call you call the majority of the match in the ring, which is the art of our business. You need to have cardio. Your brain operates on one ingredient is called oxygen. And I know this from being a young wrestler and what I call green guys disease, where you're trying to do 10,000 things all at once. And you end up blowing yourself up just out of nervousness if for no other reason. And uh, so I, I find that so many of these guys, uh, I do cardio drills at these things. And uh, if, if you have a trainer, if you have a school, I'll work with him, you know, and try to make him better, too. But the thing of it is, everybody needs to be in cardio shape. And that means you not wearing your blue jeans and a heavy sweatshirt to cover your your belly. <laughs> And I'm being facetious here, obviously, but, you know, that's part of it, too, Mike, is 
if you're going to per- play a basketball part of a basketball player in a movie, it's a good chance you should be six five or better. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that intrigued me as a kid, or even as as I got older, uh, you know, and following wrestling was, wow, I hope I never meet that guy in a dark alley. You know, you look up at the ring and you see this guy who intimidates you. And sadly enough, uh, you know, there are times that I, I watch some of these guys in ring and I think, fight them, maybe turn them over my knee and spank them, <laughs> you know, because they look like my 12 year old grandson. So, you know, this it, it's a visual business. It's an image business. So never mind that you can do quadruple somersaults or you can do 45 super kicks or or whatever your your shtick is. Uh, do you look like you can whip somebody's ass? Ah, no. Well, then strike one, you know. So it, it, there's more to it than just having, you know, hand signals and uh, a, a good music, entrance music. And, 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 and I've got this great gimmick. Uh, Rip Rogers, who is a hell of a trainer, uh, who's been the head man at uh, OVW for Danny Davis uh, for years. Uh, you know, his one of his patented sayings is, well, you have the greatest music and you have the greatest costume and you can have the greatest hand signals. But when the damn bell rings, if you can't go, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's right. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, name, you, and that's a name that still dropped the Enterprise we just had um, on the show uh, last week, I think. And uh, uh, I mentioned him as being a, a, a great trainer in that, that aspect as well. <clears throat> Yeah, he's he's good. Well, you know, and and uh, that's one of the things that I, that I, I've been blessed able to. You know, uh, you never stop learning in this business. When some kid says, "Well, I trained for eight weeks," or "I trained for six weeks," or uh, "I went to one seminar, so now I'm a wrestler." No, you're just a, you're a pain in the ass is what you are, and uh, probably not a good pain in the ass. Uh, you know, I've been doing this almost fifty six years. And I still try to improve my training methods. I try always try to improve my wrestling. Um, you know, I mentioned Harley and Ricky and I doing things to camps together. And one of the things that I always said when we did these things is between the three of us, Lord knows how many thousands of matches we, we have had collectively. I don't even have a clue. But I said, I can guarantee you that none of us have had our best match yet, meaning that we're never satisfied. The great workers, the great artists in this business aren't ever satisfied. Uh, the, you know, I, I mentioned Benoit and, and Regal, the match from the, the Pillman 2000. I don't know if you've ever seen that on YouTube or not. It's a great uh, training uh, tool if you haven't. Uh, I'm proud to say that I promoted the show uh, that they, they did this on, but it was, uh, they went, well, it's edited down in, uh, on the YouTube version, but they went around 23 minutes. Um, at the time, Regal had been out of the mainstream for over 18 months. Benoit was a star that, that, that he was. And, uh, you know, when Regal came out, the people were lukewarm. They knew what kind of match they were going to have. Uh, you, if you watch it and turn the volume up, you'll hear some idiots, saying boring, uh, but Steve and Chris stuck to their good. They knew what they went out there to do. And at the end of this match, you have 2,000 people on their feet, on their feet, going crazy. And these guys use the ropes once, I believe, but it's a match between two competitive athletes. It's not an acrobatic exhibition. It's uh, not a clown show. It's two professional wrestlers. And I know that's another thing that some of the young people, well, you know, nobody buys that anymore. Well, they buy it if you know how to sell it. Uh, it's a matter of knowing your, knowing what you're doing and not just doing something to be doing it. And, and that's what I think is lacking in our, again, it comes back to the emotional involvement, which is not there. Well, I have a hell of a playlist of matches to check out that I actually have not seen uh, from from this interview. Thank you so much for that bit. <laughs> Let me give you a yeah, but check yeah seriously, and you, what you'll see with all those matches, Mike, are stories, mm-hmm. right? And, and to me, two professional wrestlers uh, are a walking, talking book, and a good book has a beginning and a middle and an end. 
and it and it builds to something, you know. In other words, uh, to me, if you and I are are going to work a match. And if I'm putting you over, first of all, we need to know how you're going over. If you have a finish hold uh, and that finish hold means you're going to submit me with my arm, then you should be working on that or trying to get to that arm and working toward that arm through the entire match. That's so if we're going 10 minutes, we're going 20 minutes, we're going an hour. Um, you know, we're building to that, that story. And the other thing is that if, let's say, we're going 15 minutes, and you're going over, well, then you need to give me probably 65 or 70% of the match. Why? Because then you've beaten somebody. Mm -hmm. If you just dominate the match, then what have you beaten? You know, I think one of the biggest sins I see now, and it happens on major television as well, and it's a case of monkey see, monkey do, but it's, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you fire up, get a comeback in, and then turn your back on your opponent. Let me tell you about my friend Harley Race. If I'd have made a big comeback on Harley 40 years ago and turned my back on him, I, kn I know what it to, I would have expected when I turned back to face him. That big left hand coming out of, out of nowhere, <laughs> knocking me into the middle of next week, because that's the worst insult you can give to your opponent. Because if you turn your back on him, it's like saying, this guy is crap. I don't even need to face him. I've got his, you know, he belongs to me. So it's, it's, you know, the, the small things that I go over in these weekend camps, it's the intricate things, the things that most kids don't think about and most pseudo trainers don't have a clue about. And, and that's not, a, I don't mean that as an insult again. You can only teach, you know, I played a little high school basketball. Uh, Larry Bird won't ask me for uh, recommendations for the Indiana Pacers. <laughs> Uh, I can't get you ready to go to the NBA, but I can teach you how to dribble, you know, and, and most independent trainers who have never been to play, uh, worked a major company or worked with, you know, with top stars. That's, I mean, I, again, I don't mean it as an insult is it, it is what it is. You know, I can teach you a little basketball because I played a little, I can't get you ready to play at a college level or a professional level. And most of your independent wrestlers can't get you ready to go to a major company and, and know what to expect because they, they haven't been there. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, uh, so tell me, what what's coming up? Where can people find everything that you're working on? And uh, maybe even some seminars if you want to plug them. Well, yeah. You can, First of all, you can reach me at less at epwt.com or less thatcher at zoomtown.com. Those are my email addresses. Uh, if you're if you'd like to see testimonials for some of the wrestlers I've worked with or helped develop themselves or some of the promoters I've worked with, you can go to the EPWT dot com website and click on the testimonials. Uh, currently, I'm uh, well, I just I was in New Orleans uh, for a weekend camp for Luke Hawks uh, Wildcat Sports. I was just down there uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm working on, I don't have dates locked in yet. I'm working on, uh, uh, a promotion in, in Virginia, another promotion in Northern California. One talked to a promoter in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> but for sure, July the 30th, George South and I are, uh, doing a one day camp for why we wrestle at, uh, the church of Southern wrestling in Cornelia, Georgia, which is the old, uh, anarchy or NWA Wildside uh, uh, building. And then uh, one of the things that I've been doing every year for the last few years and really enjoy is from August the 4th through the 7th, myself, Tom Pritchard, Rip Rogers, Nigel McGinnis, and hopefully Lance Storm, if, if he's able to make it, are doing a four-day training camp at the uh, Mid-Atlantic Legends Fan Fest in Charlotte. And you can go to their website and find all. But it's a it's a four day camp. We train uh, morning and evening, afternoon. There are shows. It's a great place for young people to uh, network. You know, to get to know promote their promoters there, watching these guys and and the uh, whoever is the is by the trainers pick uh, at the end of the four days is uh, pick the best trainee in the camp receives the uh, the Reed Fleur. Memorial Scholarship, which is a $2,500. Now, that's nobody's going to give you $2,500 to go out and spend on a new car or something. But the way it comes is if you're using it to go to, like, say, Harley's 
uh, NOAA camp, which happens in Missouri, or or uh, you need wrestling boots, or think you know you show them receipts and <clears throat> and they pick up the tab uh, to a total of uh, twenty five hundred dollars. And uh, so those are some of the things that I'm doing, and I am open. I have open dates. Uh, I love working with young people. Uh, it's my passion. It's who I am. It's what I do. And uh, I make no guarantees, but I can pretty much uh, say that I feel that if you, you know, if you bring me in for a weekend and your people will open their ears and, and listen, uh, I can make them a better wrestler by the time I leave. There you go. Uh, thank you so much for letting us pick your brain here for a, for a, for a good while, a few minutes here. Uh, check them out. That's uh, EPWT.com. Uh, Les Thatcher on the Twitter as well and, uh, and, and everything else. And thank you so much for joining us. Mike, I hope I haven't bored you to tears. Uh, you know, once you get me started about <laughs> talking about my passion for the wrestling business, sometimes I, I run my mouth too much, but I've enjoyed talking with you and look forward to doing it again sometime. All right. Thanks a lot. And we're going to take a little peek of you on video with us or audio, a uh, little bit of those uh, uh, talk we had uh, a cup coming. Uh, Bruno San Martino in his sign dedication, as well as uh, Dan Marino happens to pop in there for a minute, just for a moment. We'll be right back with some more indie wrestling talk. It's such a such a great great honor, such a wonderful surprise, and and I like to thank really all of, uh, everybody that's uh, that's responsible for thinking of us to to for that such a great honor. My goodness, see the mayor here, Fitzgerald, and so many others that uh, it, it it's really really very touching. I made 20 tours of Japan. I've been all over the world. I wrestled all over the world. But Japan even inducted me to their Hall of Fame. And I've had some great ones here, like the International Sports Hall of Fame. I, I mean, I was inducted in that. And WWE Hall of Fame and Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. And I'm Italian American Sports Hall of Fame. But when you come here in this neighborhood where, uh, where it all began for me, because when I came from Europe and we settled here, you know, everything happened from here for me, you know. Uh, this is where I started training. This is where I got into not only weightlifting but wrestling, you know, in the amateurs. And I uh, built myself up. Uh, in my heyday, I was 275. <laughs> and and it, all, it all here in Oakland, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, to be honored, any kind of an honor in this area, right here in South Oakland, where it all began for me, I, it, 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 I think it means to me, I don't want to sound ungrateful for everything else because I'm deeply grateful for everything that's happened in my life. But to happen something here in, in South Oakland, for me, it's, I'm very deeply touched by it. I'm very grateful that they thought me worthy of this honor with these other guys, and I appreciate it very much. For us who, who came from a foreign land, sometimes, uh, and I say this not to offend no one, but I sometimes think that we appreciate it here more than those that were born here for the simple reason that we, we lived a different life over there. And when we come here, uh, for example, when I first came over here and got a little healthy, I had a couple of jobs. I would work uh, landscape gardening before they had the mower stuff, you know, you had a push. And then sometimes construction. And you were very grateful that these jobs were available to you. I was making 50 cents an hour cutting grass and working 10 hours a day on weekends and then in the summertime on my summer vacation. That was a difference. We appreciated those opportunities where kids here maybe had it better off or whatever and I'm not so sure that they understood it like we did. My God, we come to America, we can have a job, two jobs, three jobs, whatever, you know, and that's how we saw America as truly, truly the land of uh, opportunity. I know my dad, we'd ride by, he's, he's passed now and uh, we'd ride by here and my dad would always say why the hell is Bruno's name not on that sign? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then this, right? So he said Bru Bruno should be on that sign and and, uh, and then this year Tucker and I talked about it and he uh, and, and he said well we're going to rededicate that sign and put Bruno's name on there because he definitely deserved to be on that sign but man and all the stories yes. <laughs> all the stories my dad used to tell about Bruno when they are growing up and, and the whole thing and the great tradition of families in this neighborhood and, and uh, you know, the hardworking people that have come out of this neighborhood and just good people and, and friends that I've had for life. Well, Danny Marino, his dad and I, we were good friends from the time I came over from Italy. We went to school together, we were good friends. Of course when he had Danny, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the kid was a good uh, uh, 
player as a, as a young boy. But who would have ever imagined that he would grow to be what he did? You know, I mean, my God, the great quarterback, the Hall of Famer, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he's such a nice guy, you know. I mean, his dad was a super, super guy. But then he, the, uh, not that I know him like I knew his dad, but he seems like a guy who's got both feet on the ground, down to earth, and I love that. I, I love when somebody uh, is successful, uh, makes it to the top, let's say, but yet he remains humble, you know. We were just regular kids over here. We, we didn't come from wealth. You know, we, none of us hardly had anything. My, my poor dad worked in the steel mills, and he was trying to help family in Europe, you know, his, 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 his brothers and sisters and that. So we never had nothing, and we appreciated the... Uh, the, the fact that over here in Oakland, uh, we had the opportunities to, to, to work and then to, to find your way. In, 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 like in Marino, football with me was weightlifting and wrestling. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 we, we sought those opportunities that were over here. We took advantage of them. And, and I don't know if it's any different from any other person who succeeded in else, you know, elsewhere, but Oakland... Uh, to me, Oakland was always very special and always will be very special. All right, thanks once again to Les Thatcher and, and Bruno for speaking with us. And um, and, and, and Dan Marino, actually, he was a really nice guy and actually let me get a very awkward selfie so I can uh, poke fun at my Buffalo, Bill, Buffalo Bills fan uh, um, uh, father-in-law. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, a great, great time there uh, uh, with all that stuff. It was a great day of talking to legends. And uh, that was cool. And now, uh, uh, so... There was a really interesting angle uh, that 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 uh, Les Thatcher talked about about uh, describing matches as sex. Absolutely right, and it was funny because uh, earlier on the Wrestling Mayhem show, and after we had recorded the interview, uh, BC Steel here uh, of the IWC uh, International Wrestling Cartel, not that other one, uh, not the watches either. You made the bane of my social media existence <laughs> when I'm typing stuff in, uh, but you had made a random reference to like like wrestling angles and wrestling and, and, and insects which echoed what Les said in that interview and i can't believe we're doing this on the show but i'm going to let you go further with that you, you said you had a really good kind of explanation <laughs> I do. of this and how it goes right and how it goes wrong i do and uh shout out to everybody that uh, asked me how long it would take me to get graphic on the show <laughs> Um, but now watch it. This is not necessarily the graphic <laughs> no, of the two it's, shows. It's, it's, there won't be diagrams. And this anything, is also so. going to be tagged with two legends of no, wrestling. No. So. There's not going to be diagrams and things like that. But but when you think about uh, sex and wrestling, they both have one thing in common, that they all build up to the finish. That is the main part of wrestling. Whether it be an angle or a match, it's the finish. Right. So... You don't want to get rocking and rolling in there and the finish comes in two minutes because I was going to say the people watching would be unhappy, but that <laughs> in, in one of those, hopefully there's not a lot of people watching or, or maybe there are, but uh, the people involved, put it that way, may not be as happy if it's a quick finish. Uh, and <laughs> it's also more pleasurable to those involved if it goes longer, it builds anticipation and that's how a match can go. For example, the match that I use as an example is an Iron Man match. If you think Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, not saying that their match was like relations, but they built up because they had an hour to go. They didn't rush in. They, they took their time. They made things matter. And sex and wrestling have a lot in common because if you're somebody that goes in and gets to the finish right away, you may not get another opportunity. Where if you're somebody that takes your time and you know, uh, things matter and it, and, and anticipation builds and builds and builds when you finally get to that kaboom moment, it's like, wow. And then you come back down from that and then you're ready to go again. And that's not just matches. That's how you pace a card on a show. If you'll notice WrestleMania, when women's wrestling was not a focal point, they would have that before the main event. So you could come down before you would go up again, because in sexual relations, man, it's really hard to kind of Watch what I say there, but during that and in wrestling, you can't be here all the time. It, it's peaks and valleys. Yeah. So you can't always be on top. Uh, you, you can't always. Be, this is a legitimate conversation. But yeah, I, I know but you're it's, catching it's yourself. Legit, uh, yeah. It's a legit question. You can't always be on top. And when I talk to young kids and I try and explain wrestling, uh, getting past the well, he's just a manager. What does he know about it? 
Uh, and sometimes people look at me and say, he's him. What does he know about the other part that we're talking about? Um, it's if you watch enough wrestling and you think about the analogy, it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So watch an Iron Man match, watch a, a WrestleMania match. They don't go right into the finish. They tease it. They tease this finisher. They tease that finisher. And maybe you think it's over. Nope, it's not. They're going to go and do something else. So it does sound graphic and it might sound a little perverse, but there is a huge correlation between good sex and good wrestling. And there's a correlation between bad sex and bad wrestling. Hmm. That's the cleanest I can, I can that. do that. That is the absolute cleanest that I can go with that. So, <laughs> Amen, Amen. I know you've been around a lot of uh, uh, probably both the good and the bad of the wrestling. Uh, what do you think about this? Not as much as the other thing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree with that statement completely. I think that's a lot of – I don't know if it's as much the opinion of people now, but I think – Indie wrestlers had that stigma for a long time of being the guys that didn't really understand those concepts of the fact that there's, you know, there's a, there's a finish and there's a way to build to up to it and, and all that stuff. I think a lot of people really kind of sort of put indie wrestlers in this kind of box as being, oh, what they're, they're the high spot guys. They're the ones that do all the crazy stuff and there's no real story. Um, I like, I like to think that that's changed, obviously. Uh, uh, because of you know the caliber of performers that are emerging, um, but no, I completely agree. And, and yeah, I mean it's 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 a great takeaway. Obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of comparisons that you can make between the two. Certainly, certainly. Well, on that point, and so we got uh, uh, BC Steel here, and and really opportune because this weekend is IWC's Reloaded 2.0, which is reloaded rescheduled from from january when we had some snowstorm issues here in the uh, greater pittsburgh area um and it's a really interesting concept and i can't i don't know if you happen to be in attendance or anything for the first reloaded but it's, it's a concept that i outside of taboo tuesday i haven't seen uh, uh anything like this in indie wrestling and i know you're going to be a part of it uh, of course in the corner of chris larusso absolutely and it's unique because you think of the unknown in wrestling. You think of Lethal Lottery. I know it's kind of dating him. And you mentioned Taboo Tuesday, and that's what it is. You don't know what's going to happen. You know guys involved, Chris LaRusso being one of them, but you don't know what's going to go from there. So it's that that excitement, the the excitement of the unknown, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, and say so that basically the concept, even like Chris LaRusso, as we said, is going to be in a four way uh, 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 Super Indy 15 qualifying match. He doesn't know his opponents are. There's a uh, there's the reset button. And, and the first match of this, uh, the first one was a Virgil against Corey Futuristic for some reason. Um, a, the bigger one that we do know is Dylan Bostic, friend of the show, uh, taking on Billy Gunn. Yes, that Billy Gunn of the badass variety. Uh, and of course, uh, Deanna Perrazzo is making a lot of uh, big name for herself in, in uh, women's wrestling, uh, TNA, NXT, taking on Britt Baker in a quasi rematch from uh, Meadville. And, uh, and of course, uh, every title on the line, IWC World Heavyweight Champion DJZ of TNA. Uh, uh, the the fraternity who we talked to at Clearfield, we're going to have that up here in a couple of weeks on the show. Uh, they're going to be t- taking on uh, uh, mystery opponents, and they and it's not usually a tag team either. It's usually uh, uh, it could be anybody teaming yeah. up. It could be Virgil and Corey Futuristic. It, it could, wow, yeah, wow. <laughs> and of course, Andrew Palace, uh, a super indie champion, uh, taking on uh, a mystery. It could be you, BC Steel. Uh, if, if I go out there in my spandex, the divorce rate's going to go up. Uh, <laughs> men, men will be going home without their wives. That's all I'm going to say. I'll let you, uh, read between the lines there. It, it's a fun night. It's a, it's interesting to go into a wrestling show. You don't get this as much anymore where you go into a wrestling show where you don't have an idea what you're going to see by the end of the night. Uh, so a, a really cool concept that, uh, the Justin Plummer era started with good to see it's coming back. And, uh, and I believe there's also going to be a training, there's going to be a seminar uh, with Billy Gunn as well. Uh, go to IWC's uh, Facebook page and they have information on that as well. If you are a wrestler looking for, as we were talking about training with Les Thatcher earlier today, uh, but that's an option for you guys as well. Get out there in front of as many of these guys that have been to the dance as you can if you're a wrestler or your referee even. I, you know, 
uh, uh, people are still, uh, it's interesting to see the people responding to the refereeing 101 that we did with Jimmy Cordero several years ago, um, because it's an integral part. I love somebody, I think I mentioned that project to somebody a couple weeks ago. Somebody that's not in wrestling, but like, really, referees, what the hell they do, but stand there. I'm like, well, they're not doing their job if that's all they're doing. And, and I was like, no, they do this, and they do this, and they, they, they orchestrate, and they, they, they communicate, and this, this, and this. And I was, I was completely breaking the kayfabe wall with somebody <laughs> that, that was, was a, just that was just <laughs> what you see when that he goes over here and he goes over there yeah he just delivered a message between the yeah you know like that kind exactly. of stuff like it really opened my eyes and now that helps me as a video person and then you know and, and you as a manager like what does a manager do he just stands there ringside does whatever it's like no you have a job to do right? exactly and that's the biggest misconception that because somebody's funny or because they can you know, look good out there that they can stand there. A manager or referee's job isn't to be a fifth ring post. I've mm-hmm. seen that. Yeah. And it's, I've, I've, unfortunately, when I started refing, which you can uh, see me in IWC wrestling in 0102, uh, we'll get those <laughs> uploaded. They might be on VHS. We'll have to copy those. You find them, let me know. <laughs> hey, if you have them, contact <laughs> sword. Yes. But no, but it's, it's a job that I don't think people understand the importance to it or understand the psychology behind it. Even with your job as videographer, uh, Eamon is a uh, commentator. There's a psychology behind everything that's done, and it's a lot harder than just, oh, I saw it on TV. I can do that. No problem. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely something I don't think people understand what's involved with it, especially once they start learning it. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, this is way more than acting like a fool on uh, in front of a crowd. So right, right, good DVD. If anybody hasn't, they should pick it up. I've seen clips. So, so. Refereeing 101. Yes, yep. yes. Good stuff. And uh, uh, Corderas was actually on the show a couple months ago. Um, a really, really cool guy. Hey, and go go ask him questions on Twitter because he will answer you. <laughs> <laughs> well, although, yeah, there he goes. Let me, uh-huh. Like, so how was you? How was it really on the Indie Mayhem show? <laughs> so Sorg said, no, you were. <laughs> uh, guys, Eamon, uh, anything coming up with Inspire? Are you guys uh, gearing up for another show down there? Uh, eventually, we'll, we'll, we uh, kind of have posted stuff online. You can see of our, uh, of our event title, which will be forever. We haven't announced a date yet for that. Uh, so I would suggest people check out our social media, follow us on there to uh, to get more updates when that comes about. And also follow us, or not follow us, but check out our, some of our video accounts because our uh, Splendor in the Smash event should be out very soon uh, through there. So. Awesome. Hey, not only IndieWrestling.us, I know uh, a little late this month, uh, my fault, uh, but IWC, RWA, RWA is uh, also on Smart Mark Video. I uh, just kicked over the last two IWC shows, so they should be on, if not already, very, very shortly. Uh, so thank you to the guys over there for helping us uh, get the shows out there, too. Uh, really good. Everybody's getting this stuff out there. It's good to see all the Pittsburgh names, RWA, IWC, BOW, uh, alongside Inspire Pro, uh, getting out there on, on Smart Mark, where is, hey, it's it's the place between them and Highmark. Or, Highmark. Uh, wow. That's, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I have an issue with my health insurance. Uh, high spots. <laughs> uh, but uh, I will also carry IWC DVDs, by the way, too. So, uh, so thank you so much, guys. Uh, great hanging out with you guys. Uh, Eamon, Peyton, and Eamon, too, please, InspireProWrestling.com. Yes, indeed. And of course, BC Steel, the one SF podcast. Which is in its. What are you pointing at? That's I'm pointing at the little. Wait, hold on. Oh, 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 oh wow. Right, that looks. Yeah, right there. Right <laughs> there. There's where the moneymaker is. Down there. You right, see that? Yeah. Right. Uh, we thought we were still in our sex vibe from earlier. but uh, And, of course, uh, Indie Mayhem Show. Check out WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Subscribe to us on all the places. Let us know your thoughts. Good times at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Not that. That impact bell watch. What the hell? Uh, I'm hitting the wrong titles all night long. Good times at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. 412-206-WMS0 at Mayhem Show on the Twitters. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. And please support Indie Wrestling. Put a taste of the four eye Sing, 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 you know how I act now If you got a problem, come and see if I'm a back down Act wild, steady sipping jack Show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com